Yeah. Hi, welcome to this Open Security Summit session in September uh, 2022. And today we have a really cool panel where we're going to be talking about DevSecOps for Modern Identity Access Management, which is actually a pretty cool theme that we already had several sessions on the summit. And it's a great example of how we're really trying to scale security and trying to embed a lot of the activity that we want to do within the DevSecOps cycle and the, the shifting left or shifting right these days. So that definitely some cool topics. So I'm Dennis. I, I help to organize a lot of different things on the Open Summit. So Barak, we can turn you. Barak Shuster, located in Tel Aviv. I was the CTO and co-founder of Bridge Crew, the company behind the open source tool Checo, which is a policy as code tool, and today part of Palo Alto Networks. Okay. My name is uh, Marius. I work for Global Financial Services, um, senior security engineer, dealing with DevSecOps, cloud security architecture, strategy, and compliance. My name is uh, Or Weiss. I'm uh, one of the co-founders and the CEO of Permit.io, which uh, provides uh, permissions as a service. In my background, I'm a software engineer starting in the intelligence core in the IDF worked as a VP of R&D in a cybersecurity company and co-founded several dev tool companies. And I'm always excited to talk about both uh, software development and uh, security and definitely the intersection in DevSecOps. Cool. Do you want to kick us off or on, the, on yeah. this topic? Yeah, so um, I've been spending a lot of time on this and the more I spend time on identity access management and the way it connects with DevSecOps, the more I understand how big of a space this is and how much of a change is it that it is going through. Um, in the past, when we were building applications, like in the beginning of my career, I won't say how long that is, but it's pretty long ago. Uh, but like when I started, I was working with like physical machines that you would end up delivering to your customer. And everything there was a lot simpler. Uh, that server only talked to itself or maybe one other component. Uh, the software itself was contained within that machine. It, everything as part of that software was allowed to talk to every, every other part of it. Um, and there weren't a lot of complexities to handle. It was just, here's a box, use it, have fun. Uh, but then we moved to the cloud and we moved to containers and we moved to microservices and we moved to more and more complex applications. And as part of that, both the scale, complexity, and surface area of the applications that we've been building uh, have exploded out and have become far more uh, intense and complex. And now instead of having like one big component where we can manage access control, we need to sprinkle a little bit of security, a little bit of access control for every little component we're building. Um, and it affects a much larger and more complex space. And uh, in addition to that, more and more of the responsibility is shifting left. Uh, security folks are very much involved, but more and more developers have to ha take an active step in, uh, uh, in providing the security, both in the software development lifecycle and how they connect to the wider organization as a whole. Um, and this is just like the beginning as we look at more things at the horizon, like, uh, um, uh, dis distributed finance and machine learning and automated agents coming in. Uh, there's just a lot of chaos. And I think even I find it a bit overwhelming. And on the other hand, mm -hmm. and that's what I hope we can really kind of dive into in this conversation, there are a lot of good best practices uh, to mention one policy as code or uh, organized uh, soft software development life cycles. And I think it would be really interesting to talk both about these tensions that are piling up and the best practices that uh, companies are taking today to kind of tackle them. Uh, the tensions that you mentioned are interesting. Uh, just last week, I had a conversation with a friend and he, he told, I'm quoting, Rock, I can't believe that I'm saying that, but I'm, I'm missing Active Directory. <laughs> <laughs> the tool that we all love to hate um because 15 years ago or 10 years ago it was it was simple you didn't have microservices the identity was not distributed it was centralized within the active directory service yeah. um and it started with the enterprise it world but it it driven also 
into the application development space. People were writing LDAP queries and were using Active Directory as the main storage of identities. Um, and we're using it both for authentication using Kerberos or NTLM or uh, any other uh, federated identity capability. And also for permissions using LDAP queries. Uh, but it was slow. That's one disadvantage, like querying an LDAP query of a huge enterprise will take forever. Uh, it was not publicly available. So anonymous users had hard time to authenticate and to do a self-serve signup and self-serve permissions. Um, and the it was not developer friendly, <laughs> unlike Auth0 or Opal for permissions. Um, it's really not developer friendly and it was at least in my application development teams, we had these magicians uh, who knows how to write LDAP queries and knows how to integrate into the Active Directory Kerberos SPN services. Uh, and this tribal knowledge is now kind of gone from a lot of application development teams, which makes it even harder. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, indeed. I think, I think the problem in, in some ways stems that obviously developers are always trying to find a way to do their job and to make it quicker to build the code and release. But I find myself because I've been building like DevSecOps frameworks and helping obviously embed security into development life cycles. And there's always there's always a steep learning curve before because you know you're trying to do, for example, like release code to you know to live production. You know, for example, I ask always that we we have an approval uh, sort of that you know one person can't just release the code. There has to be someone approving the code to make sure that there's a communication that we're releasing the code. And they always say, oh, why? It's just another step, you know, by saying, okay, look at the attacker's perspective. Your machine gets compromised and an attacker can release anything. So if you're just getting a sign off from say someone in, in another team saying that you're releasing the code and they ask you, oh, are you releasing the code? And they say, yes, I am. Okay, everything's fine. Code codes gets released, you know, just simple things as that. I think people don't understand, for example, as well, we just touched a bit on permissions. Like people don't realize if you look at normal, um, for example, role in Azure, some of the roles have 2000 permissions. They're not really sometimes designed for purpose, but who's going to take time to, you know, narrow down and remove this, the unnecessary permissions. And that's a, that's a huge task in itself, but, you know, to, to invest the time at the front and make sure that you define roles and, and specific permissions in your in your kind of you know situation or setup can save your you know headache down the line. Mm -hmm. I really That's like so the intersection point between uh, your two points, uh, Barack and Marius. Uh, I think like with Active Directory, one thing it made things easier, but it also made things very vulnerable. Like back in the Windows Server days, like for an attacker to get possession or get access to the Active Directory itself, that's like game over. You've dominated the entire network. And now this distribution on the one hand, it makes, there's a lot more to learn, a lot more complexities, but it's also harder for the attackers to some degree. And finding that balance point between who's allowed to do what and who's allowed to affect who can do what essentially a recursive aspect, essentially authorization for authorization is something that is kind of also propagating into the space. And uh, I find myself thinking a lot about it because I'm building an authorization solution. So building the authorization for the authorization solution uh, for everyone is uh, can be mind boggling at times. Mm -hmm. So look, my, my view on this one is I think, you know, the, the way to solve this is to embrace the business challenge. Right, and the business challenge is that the reason why we need identity access management is because we want to make, the business will define that we want to access these assets by these people at this moment in time. Right. In fact, the zero trust concept is actually some of it is pretty cool, right? Because it talks about who you are, where you are, where you come from, what we know about you, what you want to do. That intersection that almost gives you the formula of what you can actually do at this moment in time. Um, and I think, you know, I've seen lots of lots of authentication systems and, you know, especially on my pen test days or security review days. And I always find that it was complex that killed it, right? It was, you know, there was this weird curve between when you, things were simple, you can kind of get it right. 
reasonably well. Um, when things became very complex, it was actually the complexity of the permission model that actually tend to create the biggest vulnerabilities, especially because if you don't have a good workflow, you sprinkle secure decisions left, right, and center in your code, or in fact, in most of your stack, right? And, and I, I think there's, there's a kind of a theme more and more, which is, you know, security a lot of the time is, is, is almost like talking about problems that the business has, right? Like imagine if the business had a great understanding, by business, I mean the, the people or the teams designing the systems, mapping them out, defining who does what, basically, you know, the user stories, all that stuff. If those teams have a great understanding of identity management, a lot of the work that we want to do would be easy, right? Because we could map it, we can do some reviews, we, we would do a threat model and go, hey, this is the stuff, et cetera. The problem is that the business also does, in most cases, does not have a good way to visualize this, does not have a good way to graph this out, doesn't, doesn't have good schemas to do this. Um, and I feel that we miss a trick sometimes by not, embracing that directly, where what we're really solving is a business problem, but we want to do it, yes, we're coming from a security point of view because we actually can verify and check it, but ultimately it's a business problem, which is how do you make sure that the right person or the right asset is accessed by the right entity at the right time uh, with only the right requirements and when they don't need it, get rid of it, right? All that stuff, right? I think you were touching on a, a very critical and important point. And I think another interesting angle of it is that the developers or the people on the business side working on these things, they don't necessarily care about them. They just want them to work. And there's always this tension between being able to get your business to run and keeping your business secure and building yeah. things right. And I think um, the way to go about this is to provide people with the tools that will enable them to achieve this without much effort so they can actually focus on their business. Um, I think we saw this coming in both the identity management space and in the, and I think very clearly in the authentication space, like uh, uh, like 10 years ago, if you uh, go to developers and tell them, um, how about you use a third party solution to build authentication? Most people would say, no, no, what are you crazy? It's a core part of our application, how we verify our users. How can I trust someone else to do this for me? Uh, but as time passed and the authentication solutions became more mature, um, people realized that it's actually very hard to do and get this right. And it's actually not unique to their business whatsoever. So they are much better off delegating this to other people. And now this is the standard. It's, you'll be hard pressed to find people building authentication on their own, especially with the new things coming like passwordless and biometrics and magic links and all that fun stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so that shift has already happened, but when we are talking about permissions, um, it's not quite there yet. Uh, so permission solutions, uh, like the one I'm working on with Permit.io are starting to emerge, but people haven't shifted their minds to do that yet. So there's still a lot of friction as people are trying to tackle these non-unique aspects as part of building their business, uh, while bas basically slowing down their own business. Um, and I'm like in general with Permit IO, we're really we're really trying to provide low code interfaces. The idea is you'll be able to do this without actually fully understanding all the complexities. Um, and uh, this also connects to some other best practices, like uh, one I mentioned at the beginning: policy as code. Uh, in the yep. end, of the day, trying to translate this uh, all of these complexities into something that we know how to manage in other areas, uh, code, for example. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, yeah, why not? Who in, who in your org is responsible to to model the permissions? Well, I, I'll, I can say on our on our org, it, it depends. Even if everything is in the cloud and we're digital native, if it's an enterprise IT application, that would be one group with a decision tree distributed between managers. And if it's an application code, that would be like a different persona, the code architect would be responsible for that and some of the team leads. Um, I wonder how the process looks like on your enterprises and who owns permissions and, define, and defining what's right, defining the policy, and uh, mm -hmm. how's the process of changing that looks like? Also. That's a very good question. I can share my perspective on this from like through our customers uh, that we engage with. I think, 
the one thing that is most apparent is this is no longer one person's job. It used to be when it was simple, when you just have like admin, not admin, or very basic RBAC. You had like uh, uh, the security team or an app engineering team structure this out, hard code this into the product. And usually that will be it with a few iterations. But because products have moved to the cloud, because things are changing rapidly, because uh, you're adding more capabilities and connecting to more and more distributed areas, um, permissions have become a very dynamic, ongoing, very lively thing, which affects basically everyone in the business. Because uh, in the end of the day, connecting users and partners to your product is the main thing you're doing if you're building a product. Um, so we're seeing people engaging with us and with our product or with the open source projects that we produce across, across the entire organization. So we obviously see developers, they are the ones usually starting this and trying to find a solution to cater to all the different requirements that the different stakeholders are bringing in. You see product managers really trying to think about what is the right way to manage? What is the right model to manage? How our users work with our product? How our internal teams should connect to the product? You see uh, security folks, uh, security practitioners wanting to monitor this and manage this, wanting to give stamps of approval on the permissions being created. And you are seeing people at support, professional services, sales, also trying to engage with this as they're trying to adjust the experience for their, the customers that they're onboarding. So everyone needs to chime in on the experience. And I think the challenge moved from, should this be one person? It should move, it move to who's the main person that kind of sets the ground rules and allowing everyone to chime in on the conversation and most importantly how people chime in on the conversation because different people on the list that I mentioned have different skill sets. A developer can go in and write policy as code but you can't really expect your average product manager to do so. A uh, security... Who, yeah, ahead, who defines what would be what would be the structure like when we designed an active directory or when we design a permission within an application, you mentioned the threat modeling and maybe Marius and, and, and Dennis also have some like to share on that. We had someone guiding the application development team. Hey, this is what you should take into account. When the teams are distributed and those questions are not centralized, who owns that today? So I think the policy monitoring and auditing process can be centralized. Okay. But the process of evolving it with the ongoing application uh, still needs to be handled by a case by case basis by the people working on it. That's my two cents. Mario, do you wanna have a go first? Yeah, I think it depends on the company structure. Obviously, you know, I work in big organizations where sort of permissions come sort of, it's based on a, on a group basis normally because you can't manage permissions per user basis as it becomes too much cumbersome. So normally you have a department that's either uh, can be a service desk or sort of support or platform support normally that, you know, there is a new user coming on board, for example, an email comes from HR and obviously the user gets onboarded onto specific groups based on their team, based on their role and based on their responsibility model. So a key, I think the key task there is to assume what they're going to be working on and their kind of the, the, the remit of the role. I think the problem where it stems, and I've seen from many examples, is that you have to standardize that and you have to write crucial policies because you know there is a there is a certain you know we can talk about human error and deviation from the standard because that's always stems and, and becomes uh, you know problematic because the problem is i and i see a lot of that because you know you're trying to separate admin roles non-admin roles because normally users because of the ease of use they will use the admin roles for day-to-day -day tasks that sometimes not necessarily need admin permission. So you, mm -hmm. you, the crucial point is to separate that. And then normally you have, you know, user with two roles. So specific, they have a user role. They can only read everything for what they need. And then they have an admin role, which basically gives them permissions to change or change a config or spin up a virtual machine and stuff like that, where they can, 
you know, through, um, you know, I, uh, privileged identity management that can scale up, say, based on approval uh, workflow that you can, say, get it for hour, two, three, four, however you need to do your job, and then you go back to user role. And that's the key crucial point that, you know, if you're not enforce that, because the key point, I think, is, is getting procedures, policies in place to make sure, because normally... I always say to people, you know, we, we put procedures and policies in place to reduce human error, because once we standardize that, that's the key point of why we're doing it. Yeah. I think yeah. we also need to kind of clarify the different levels here, because I think uh, in some parts we are talking about different levels. So you have the level of enforcing access to the actual things, like to the application, to a specific resource. You have the uh, defining of the policies uh, that gives you permissions to do stuff. So when you have like an RBAC policy, role-based access control policy, that uh, according to the different roles, people will get that underlying enforcement level access. Uh, and you can also have ABAC and REBAC and a, a ton of other models we can talk about later maybe. And there's actually a level higher that we've been, I think, touching on, which is who can change the policies? Uh, who can create new roles? who can assign users to roles, who can add permissions to a role, who can add conditions or attributes to the ABAC policy. And that's kind of a meta level on top. And then there's another level on top of who can, uh, in general, author policies, who can approve those policies. And that's where, in general, my um, the best practice I like to engage uh, uh, connect there is policy as code. If all of this complexity boils down to code that you maintain in a, in a repository where you can apply code review, where you can apply automated tests, when you can apply uh, benchmarking, when you can have different people chime in and make sure that it applies, then you can propagate that back down the chain and make sure everything is trustworthy and being done by the right, right people. And honestly, you can add more meta levels. You can add, for example, uh, an automated tool that will check the code, pro this DLC process for the uh, authoring of the permissions policies. Uh, and it can get, again, very mind boggling very quickly. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, but look, I just wanted but, to kind of cover the different levels. Look, you know, I, I think, first of all, going back to Barak's point, right? The, the, the people who tend to own it tend to be the people who understand it, right? And the people who have a requirement to do it, right? And in, in organizations, especially like organizations, this is actually like Mars was talking about. You have from normal IT, JML kind of permission models all the way to development, to customers, to systems, to supplies, et cetera, right? I, I, I feel a lot of this is that the, the path is very clear, right? The only way to scale a good permission model that works in an effective way is to use central, some of the centralized authentication systems and centralized authorization systems within the scope of that project. Right? So when I mean centralized, it means that it's not freaking written in the middle of the code. It's, it's, it's a very unified standard that you can connect to it, right? Now, it doesn't mean that you have one for an organization. Probably no, right? Big organization will have dozens of these, right? In fact, in, in a weird way, it's sometimes you want it the smaller the model, the better, right? Because again, it's actually, like we say, it, it does create a, a nice security by not having single points of failure, but also that you don't need sometimes this whole thing. But but I feel that it's important to, to take into account that this requires a big change on the other side, right? Like, you know, to add up to basically, the thing about this is to add policy as code to an application, for example, that does not have a CI pipeline, forget it, right? To add this to an application that is already not doing a lot of sector of ops practices, forget it, right? It's kind of, there's a maturity, right? If they don't even have, you know, infrastructure as code, forget about adding policy as code, right? Now, there's a path here that leads to it. And I've, I feel that some of it is also working with the business and actually working with the developer team because I feel that the developer teams love this, right? Because it's actually what they like to do, right? This structure, defining things as code, mapping things there, that's, you know, the, I would say the new modern teams, they're all about that, right? And I think we can provide some great paradigms. We can provide some great frameworks for them to manage it. But part of the challenge is walk the business to the point where this ends in their roadmap. This is part of their sprints. This is something that there's risks here that we say, um, this risk will be mitigated because of this. And actually, or one of the questions I, I asked your colleagues was that, 
what we're really good is to, and I think in, in, let's say in this part of the cybersecurity industry, right, is to say, if we think about identity access management, what are the risks? What are the policies? What are the standards that are impacted by doing it well and doing it wrong? So, you know, what are the ISO 27, what are the, the, the NIST CSF, what are the PCI compliance, what are the GDPR, what are the other standards that you might want to apply, which parts of it are like the OASP open um, the software assurance with your model or the BSIM, right? Yeah. So there's some really good already standards that give you the hooks. In fact, the OASP ASVS, Application Security Verification Standard has sections on this. And I think yeah. this is very important because I feel that some of these, we, we need to also make a good business case of why this is critical. And the reason why we're doing this is critical is because we need something that scales and there should be some policies, there should be some activities that we should be doing that if we do it right, you get a check on that one. I, you know, you're doing that. If you're not, you know, we have a danger. And just to add up, you should also add incidents. So the reality is, if you have a badly designed identity access management system, you should have incidents. If you do, then the risk is simply not there, right? Because if you have a badly identity access management system, but somehow the business managed to run it effectively and, and managed to, and maybe the change is not that big, or maybe the assets are not that massive, or maybe it's well contained into like a super secure system, then you have 10 layers before you even get to the place where everything is badly designed then it doesn't matter, right? So I think it's important, the incidents, and again, you should be linking the incidents to the root cause. And sometimes the root cause is complexity. And I feel a lot of people miss the trick here. They go, oh, the incident happened because that person made this code or they made this change or that person made a mistake, et cetera. No, 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 that person only made a mistake because that person was flying so close to the sun and, and he actually didn't make 50 mistakes. He happened to make one mistake. But that was not a mistake. That was almost an inevitability because if you're playing close to the sun so often, you will make mistakes, right? right. I, I, and I think those risks, you know, those incidents are a great a way to say, if you want to have this problem solved in a good way, I, in six months from now or a year from now, we're still talking about the same problems. We need to go into a much more scalable identity access management, which then, as you're saying, or has all sorts of levels which is good because it means that the more the business or the more we can implement these practices, the better it becomes. Mm -hmm. I think with the standards that you mentioned, it's, we're, in, we're at an interesting point. It's an interesting junction in time. I think um, almost if you look at all the high level compliance standards like GDPR and more on the security side, like SOC 2 and ISO, uh, and also like vertical specific ones like HIPAA and PCI, all of them, when you end up looking at the processes that they require, and all of them require processes, they don't require any specific technological solutions in most cases. Um, all of these processes are almost always about access control or how you're doing the interactions around access control. Uh, but they don't tell you how to do them. They just tell you that you need to have some way. You need someone to create a policy and decide who can access things. You need to have a utility where you track that access, things like that. Uh, you need to limit that access to only specific individuals under specific monitoring. You have things yeah. like OWASP that you mentioned that they takes you another step forward. They tell you, for example, the uh, last year's A A01 uh, uh, category in OWASP is broken access control. So they tell yeah. you specifically, you need to care about broken access control. If you don't take care of that, your entire security model would be at risk. But they don't tell you how to fix it. And uh, they gave you some hints, they pointed some projects, but uh, there's no like, uh, here's a recipe, follow that and you'll be good. Um, and in the end of the day, because every organization, every application, every product you're building is a snowflake, it's really hard to give something that is, here's a, 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 a silver bullet that you can use and will cover all, the, all your bases. Um, the only thing that we, I try to do with people is, is help them understand the, the tools and best practices that they can use. So I'm, I try to make sure that people are aware of policy as code and decoupling policy from your code um, and about building your uh, authorization level in an event-driven fashion. And then we can yep. talk about projects like OPA and OPAL, um, and we can talk about services that you can use. 
And then people need to decide how much effort they want to put in into getting to those best practices and implementing this. But unfortunately, I don't think, uh, at least I don't know how to tell people, this is exactly what you need to do uh, if you're deciding to build this on your own. Um, what I try to encourage people to do is, well, not completely build this on their own. At least use some open source components that someone else put in some thought about the best practices. Yep. And that, that's actually a, a, a really great way to, I think, rationally drive people to the conversation, which is instead of getting into a rabbit hole of, of arguing about, you know, forcing other people to do work, is that if you can define special and enterprise, the gates between systems or the gates to access certain type of assets or the evolution of a product, you can say, look, here are the requirements, right? The re and, and the requirements, you, in, in, that's why, again, the standards or the, the description are important. Right? The, the requirements, in a way, are a gamification into the right direction. So instead of saying, you have to use this, you say, look, hey, you guys can do whatever you want. But <laughs> if, you, if you have identities, you need to manage like this, 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 this. Right. And, and then, you know, these days, the problem is it's, it's a complex world. Like say, hey, you have to handle GDPR erasure. You have to handle GDPR's request for information. You have to handle monitoring. You have to handle JMLs. You have to handle, you know, all these pro pro properties, monitoring, security, et cetera. So it's in a way you, you, you stack the things to say, look, you guys can do it. You know, your team can go and reinvent the wheel. But here is the requirements that you need. And then you say, look, if you don't want to deal with these requirements, here are baked solutions that will do this. So, so basically the logic is to say the cost of implementing all of that, you know, will be greater than implementing the solutions. But there's still the off chance that somebody might come up with a great way or they might react to the architecture that they don't need a lot of it. Because that's sometimes the problem. The problem here is that a lot of teams don't ask the question, do I need this access? Do I need this data? Do I need that? So as you stack them up, you go, hey, you know, you might not need all this, but if you want it, this is almost the rules of the game that you have to play with, or you need to get this sign off by your boss and your boss's boss and your boss's boss's boss, et cetera, that basically you having an application that breaks this, 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 right? And, and that is a much more healthy way to, to work with the teams, which is, again, I, I like incidents because incidents gives you evidence. Right, mm -hmm. you know, ultimately, incidents. And so, my approach to incidents, and if you talk to anybody who, who from my teams, is that I always take P2s and I run that P1s. P3s, I run that basically. We always have P1s. The only question is whether they're real P1s or they're P1s that we elevated. And the reason we do that is because we go deep, right? We, we look at the root causes. We, you know, we use Jira to map a lot of this stuff, but what I'm really interested in is not why something happened, but what created the environment for that to happen. And then when you, when you look at it like that, you are finding that it's lack of identity management, lack of JML, lack of good processes, hard-coded credentials, hard-coded you know, identity management systems, all that stuff, right? Badly implementation, you know, all sorts of things. So that's a much more healthy way to drive business transformation so that the teams are asking, the right questions, and then the game starts, right? Because then you have to have freaking good solutions, right? The good news is I think these days we, we can scale a lot more than we did 10 years ago, right? 10 years ago, it was like when people talk about identity access management, like, yeah, we don't really have a lot of great things to, to recommend, right? Apart from, you know, some, some centralized stuff, which even then they didn't scale that well. What I think these days, it's, we're in a much better place because we have really good patterns and really good examples. Um, actually, James Hooker is here. Uh, can you chip in? Because we had a really good comment on this. Uh, you should be able to unmute yourself. Hello. Can you hey. see me? Hear me? Hi. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this is th these are these are problems that um, that I you know I would imagine that a lot of organisations have specifically when you come into organisation and they've been running for a long time and there's permissions. Firstly, the permissions are a mess to begin with, and you need to you know, you first need to wade through that. Um, but um, so I, I, I went to an organization that had, well, there were, it was a 140 year old organization. So you can imagine um, they still had some 70s equipment running, right? Um, still had, it was still, still had, really had some messy and outdated authentication methods. Uh, so we decided that um, to start looking at IGA products. Um, and 
one of the main problems it was to solve is what one thing we couldn't get away from was is that we had developers who had to have admin access in order to fix things and it's the age-old problem that most organizations have true separation of duty for developers of some developers is very very difficult um so what we wanted to do was we wanted a solution that could perhaps um only give certain permissions to certain things certain bastion host boxes um de or deploy functions during change windows so rather than just having keys to the kingdom for everything they were able to it, there were event driven identity access so what you would call you know just in time access stuff right um but then what we as as part of the as, as Dennis alluded to there, the implementation cost and time for that is immense. It was going to cost two or three times more than the product, especially when the big four get their hands on it. So um, one thing that we one thing that we did was to stop it happening again, we we had identity by design, we called it. So the idea was you had those policies and we had a set of canned um, canned access levels like um, account types that we would put against anything we were building or anything that we were bringing in and if something didn't fit into that then a BA would have to go and define that and then put that in the IGA solution and it got to a point where we had you know by looking at groups for instance like the old days you could just see by the naming of it exactly what this person had access to but then there was a, a load of um there was a flow that it had to go through an order of things to pro to provide access to that and if it wasn't a change window they didn't act get access to to anything um, but on the other side of it if they were then in the production system you know all of their all of their um commit functions were taken away from from git for instance so you could we could reduce the risk of that separation of duty but not erase it fully um an iga an iam was the answer for us but I'd imagine that that might be a little bit outdated now, like <laughs> putting those two together. Mm -hmm. I imagine there's solutions that are doing all of that. Um, but yeah, event-driven, event-driven um, access management and that that uh, identity by design. So as part of the design, as part of the acceptance, the technical acceptance, it had to have those defined roles that would go into the IGA solution. And then, of course, that mammoth task of weeding through an old AD infrastructure to try and transfer that over was a, was a nice, fun year. <laughs> I think what Dennis mentioned as well, you know, if you're talking about, you know, at the end of the day, you normally do identity access management based on whatever, whatever risk is business facing. And you're going to weigh that against, you know, cost of implementation but as well as cost of running it if, if it becomes too cumbersome to run it it's going to fall by the wayside so it has to be simple something that you can manage it that your people can manage it and it allows people to actually do their do their work against obviously the risks that you face so you know it it, it has to be something that you actually can implement and run and that's and that's a, that's i think the key point in this mm -hmm. Absolutely. And obviously, when you go when you go into this, people say, you know, you can reduce your access management team down to one person. And then as you get into the implementation phase, you realize you end up with more people than what you started with. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that can be. But the, you know, the results at the end of it are that granular, that, that granularity that you need, um, that you, you that you always want, which is always way too, you know, way too time and resource heavy uh it's it's uh those those types of solutions are quite good at, at, at giving you having you cake and eat it so to speak but, but one thing that for me I, I feel we're still missing a trick right and i think some of the vendors or some of the people providing service on this should should do a better job is that ultimately it's a visualization game right ultimately um it's 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 actually about being able to write static analysis on top of a graph right which i i remember doing a security review once in SharePoint, and I was way into static analysis at the time, right? Uh, and I realized that I, I almost needed to write a static analysis parser and rules and visualization just to understand who could access what document, because it was so complex, right? The rules were so complex. It's not just humanly impossible to do it. It was almost like, it's not even a simple graph. It's like, the, especially this was kind of for more 
I would say, on the agency side where, you know, person A could not see person B's data and, and there was all sorts of other things, right? But, you know, I, I realized that this is a graph problem. And one of the things that we still don't have today is good ways to visualize the graphs. Because in a way, part, part of the reason why we also need a graph is you need evolution. Right? You need to be able to show the progress. You need to be able to show what's going on. And in fact, a lot of the breaches can be detected by a graph. You know, hey, this node is accessing stuff that it's not supposed to access. Also, more importantly, we tend to talk about security a lot about a moment of breach. But more and more, I'm not interested on the first part. What I'm interested in is what the attackers are doing. Right, and one of our biggest defense mechanisms, and sometimes why a lot of attacks are not materialized, is because it's not just good enough to get in. It's not just good enough to get access to an identity. Like that's not what the attacker wants, right? The attacker wants to do X, right? And to do X, you're going to be doing a lot of other stuff. So one area that I feel is very important is to be able to create a graph of, for example, the current state of affairs. And the reason why that's important is that you can then see the impact of your changes. Because that's also very important. Like it's kind of interesting. We, we talk about test driven development, which is great, right? And everybody today would agree that you don't you shouldn't ship code without tests, right? But we do the same thing for our transition models. We do the same thing for our DevSecOps changes. You know, when was the last time you saw a test of your Terraform script, a test of your authentication systems, a test of, of these things? And the reason tests are important is because they verify your assumptions, they verify that you know, these things happens and the verify that tomorrow still behaves the way you think today behaves, right? So if you have graphs of, for example, the, the feeding of your authorization models and who's actually doing what and who's accessing, and these logs exist, by the way, you know, it's already exists throughout the organization. We actually have first an understanding of reality, which should look like a fucking massive blob, right? Like until somebody show me a graph of a gigantic blob, I know that we're not even playing the game, right? Because that's what it looks like. I think Barak, you or or you mentioned you're mentioning that AWS and Azure and all these guys have insanely complex permission problems, right? You try to map that in the graph, and the graph looks like a freaking blob, right? Because you have too many connections, you have too much stuff. There's actually way too much complexity. But the beauty of having that blob is you can now do something about it. You can now think about how I can fix it, and you can write tests, or you can write ways to understand how to do that. But without that visualization, um, you're still flying blind, right? And, and in fact, you could be doing, you could be applying authorization to the wrong place of the organization. Yeah, mm -hmm. the, the thing that we do to handle those situations, um, we do two things. Um, I'm talking about the cloud identity. There is like three yeah. layers, the, the enterprise identity, the cloud identity, and the application identity. And all of yeah. them needs an auditing process and a permission process. For the cloud identities, the thing that, that we as a team try to do is to, to build a graph of the code using the Terraform graph. We manage our own identities and roles using Terraform. Yeah. And we audit those Terraform created identities using Chekhov or OPA or TFSEC, like any Terraform static analysis tool. We'll, we'll bring you one step closer if you're writing your policies of cloud identities on top, or you can use the out of the box one. So I'm the creator of Chekhov, so I'm using Chekhov as my favorite tool. Um, and and the second thing would be to monitor for drifts uh, because you can manage identities in code, but all of us had production issues and a pager duty at Friday night, and we got to yeah. call and hey, I, I got to get access now to that cloud resource, and someone yeah. did a manual change. Uh, through the AWS console or Azure console. Um, and now we have a drift between whatever the identity is defined in code and was agreed on and, and approved using a pull request process, um, now drifted away from what exists in the runtime piece. Uh, so you can use a CSPM product or CIEM product, uh, whether it is Palo Alto or something else, um, to identify what drifts you have and where you have overprivileged access to the cloud identity. Um, if you are moving into the enterprise IT space, probably CASB solutions are the way to identify those situations. And if you're moving to the application space, uh, probably OPA or Cognito or, or other services are the best way to manage, like permit, uh, are the best way to uh, manage, identify and collaborate. The thing that I, I found missing, for example, on our end, 
is the ability to collaborate and ag agree with the product management and with application development teams on what what the ap application services look like. Let's take a, a, an imaginary application. Let's say that I'm building a pet store and I need an owner and I need a, a cashier and other roles are being added as things are being added into my application and and things change within the application. Uh, the ability to identify and add more roles and get more code is getting harder and harder over time. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I developed the first version of the application, I had one identity in mind, admin or the main user, the main persona um, on application identities. And as the application have developed and addressed more personas, it's it's hard to do the code changes. And that's that's the real challenge on application identities. It's hard to do the code changes that will enable um, more people to get access. And it's hard to collaborate and to do a, a review process and audit process on those. Yep. Really that's why like, we, we no, go on. Go on. I really liked, uh, Denise, I really liked your blob metaphor. Um, it's like how all these things just keep connecting and piling up onto one another and you need to kind of visualize and be able to work with that. Um, but I think it's not just about visualizing it. It's about actually making it accessible and uh, easy to work with. Um, I like to look at the bigger organizations like Facebook, Google, how they address these things. So they have the ability, they literally have the ability to map out these blobs but they don't just give people a graph navigation interface and let them uh, navigate through that graph to try and solve things. They build smart components on top and create yeah. human uh, interfaces, human organizational flows on top of that. I'll give an example from Facebook. And I think they also connect to that uh, uh, tension that uh, James described before. On the one hand, you wanna be able to move quickly on the one, on the other hand, you don't want to, uh, and you don't want to like stop the organizational flow. On the other hand, you don't want to let people do things that are not supposed to. So, for example, that just-in-time access or uh, emergency access. Um, so, at Facebook, what they do is they give developers uh, access to almost everything all the time. But every step that you do, there's a smart component that looks at it, uh, and essentially an AI. And it makes decisions to translate your interactions with the system back into organizational flows. So for example, if they see that you query more than you're usually query, if there's an anomaly, they will ask your teammate. The system itself will go to your teammate or your team lead and ask them, does this make sense? Should he be doing all of these queries? Um, another thing that they do is that they uh, look at the quotas themselves and the pace. They can apply other solutions like throttling, uh, like PAI redaction. And so the way you interact with the system changes as you're interacting with it. And all of those interactions you get back are in the end of the day, uh, communications between humans and the system itself in, in interfaces that are very basic, like yes, no, uh, replying to an email, checking a box. And this is something that everyone can connect to even if you're not a developer. Um, we still need to, there's a lot more to do to make, take these things that the giants have built and make them accessible for everyone. But I really think that that's the way to go, to have smart components that oh, yeah. everyone can take off the shelf and uh, uh, help them connect to this blob without necessarily having to completely understand the blob because we don't have time for blobs. We have businesses to build. No, component is the way to do it. But but the, the power of the blob or the visualization is to give you the feedback loop, right? Mm. And and sometimes without the graph, you don't understand the sweet spots, but also you don't see progress. So it's it's really important. And, and look, and, and, and those guys, they've been doing it a long time, but also they've changed the architecture and the need, right? So you have those endpoints, right? Which is right. which is great. But but in a lot of organizations, understanding the scale of the problem is almost the first step. So you can give very good steps, right? On this, and actually, Barak, one of the things you were mentioning is also trying to understand the organization. So this is the other part of cybersecurity, which actually, in a weird way, we should all be collaborating because we have, in, for the, in this part here, identity access, identity access management, we have the same problem that thread modeling has, that code review has, that a lot of other parts, which is we need to understand how the app actually fucking works, right? And the problem is 
uh, we, 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 we gone down this crazy path where the DevOps world and the agile world almost has viewed documentation and architecture as an anti-pattern, right? Where it's kind of like, hey, we don't need to document it. We just do it and rinse and repeat, right? And that has a lot of advantages, uh, although we already have data to sometimes to show that it backfires in the medium term. But we have a problem that the business and sometimes the organization don't understand how it works. And if you don't understand how it works, you know, there's no way you can freaking start defending it, right? Or no way you know where the best place to, to hook it. So identity is actually not a bad place to drive some of this. Because for example, you need to know where your data is, right? Because you can't protect, <laughs> think about it, like, if you wanna make sure the data is only accessed by the right people, you're asking really good questions. You're asking who are the right people? Oh, you know, uh, you know how do I identify them? What are they doing? Cool, the actions and what are they accessing? Oh, cool, where are the assets, right? So. You know, if you don't know where your assets are, you can't protect from the right people or the wrong people accessing the assets, right? But even sometimes a simple question of who or which, which services has access to the assets or should have access and we, where do they exist and who owns them and all that jazz, right? It's not a trivial question, which is again, we, we should be buying that problem because if you, even if you solve that, you add lots of business value to an organization. I think that the additional question would be, let's say that you mapped who owns it and you mapped the policy and it's been a few months since then or a year since then. You need to ask yourself, is it still relevant or is this white policy is actually in use or can I make it a least privileged mm -hmm. policy? Can I minimize it? There, is, there should be some kind of a refresh mechanism. Yeah, but, but, but that, decisions. Yeah, so, so the, the, what I would challenge you is that you cannot create a mapping the way I'm describing without the feedback loops. Right, and the only way you make the feedback loops is if you make the people that own things accountable, because that gives you the feedback loop. So the logic here is that if every one of us own a particular section of the code base or the system, once you map the identity, or once you map, let's say, the assets, you go to each one of us and says, you own this. And very quickly, you're telling them that fuck, if something goes wrong, it's your responsibility. And I guarantee you that every person will go, whoa, whoa, that's not mine, that's theirs, right? Or, but that's important, right? Because ultimately, you people need to take responsibility for things, right? Um, a, a system that you design for these mappings has to be self-sustaining. A system that you update once a year is not. A system that you update once a month is not self-sustaining because the business changes almost every day, every week, right? So you need a system that has feedback loops. And the only way to create the feedback loops is to give people the data, right? It's to show, hey, you know the blob? This is the bit that maps to you. This is the bit that maps to you. And I know it feels a bit hard, but without that, you don't have good data. Without that, you have one person in time, like it's like you have an investigator that went to the jungle and come back and go, hey, this is the map that I think <laughs> it is, right? But that doesn't scale, right? You, you need to give this to the developers, to the business owners, technical owners, the people who actually own the data and get them to validate this and get them to define actually what they want to happen, right? And then you go to them with reality, right? And say, hey, by the way, you told me that you wanted this, this, this. Guess what? That's not possible. And every vulnerability, every monitoring that you do, in fact, your logs can sometimes find tens of vulnerabilities because your logs will show people A accessing people B, which is why, again, if you show me a graph of access data and I, and I immediately almost guarantee you that you're gonna find vulnerabilities, you're gonna find incidents, you're gonna find people accessing data they're not supposed to access, not maliciously, sometimes even by accident, right? I think- you know, yeah. The, I think that I connected. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, uh, James. Oh, I was, I was just going to jump in just quickly and say when um, if if I if I, if, I, if I'm talking to someone who has got a Microsoft environment either on tin or in the cloud, um, and they want and they and they think, oh yeah, we've got identity down pretty well. Just give them Bloodhound, tell them to run that. And then it will just map out literally, you know, a nice graphical map of oh, you know, <laughs> this <laughs> this this isn't good, and um. Yeah, you can. So, so sometimes those talk, sorts of tools are really good to at least highlight. Well, good for ongoing monitoring just to make sure that everything's, everything's running. But yeah, that can. That's a that's a nice scary tool that people people like to use. Yeah. Uh, I really like the or I really connected to the ongoing aspect of like that blob constantly having more things added into it. And I think the most exciting thing and the most scary thing is that the pace in which the blob is growing is constantly going to speed up. Yeah. Uh, 
technology is going to get more interconnected, applications are going to get more complex, the speed of interconnectivity on automation is going to increase. So that blob is going to ongoing become more and more uh, complex itself. So I think it's really about how you build an ongoing process on top of that blob. Yeah. And I have like, okay, I've solved the access control, I can go to bed. It's something that you need to constantly yeah. keep, keep tabs on. And I'm telling you, like, like, if you look at the financial industry, right, it's a great example of what happens when there's no regulation, when there's regulation, when there's instance, no incidents. The reason why some big financial institutions have all sorts of crazy policies and processes is not because some dude come one day and says, I'm going to screw this business over and really slow it down. It's because they had incidents in the past and the incident occurred because lots of control and because people access the wrong things. So you put something in place, right? And then you put something else in place, but you, you, sometimes you tend to put things that are not scalable and that just piles up on top of the other one. And then the new generation comes along and go, Hey, screw that. We're not going to do that. We're just going to accelerate here. And they get that to a point until complexity again hits them over the head. So the reality is that we can, there's a very strong business case to say, if you don't get identity access management right, we will slow down the business, literally. And the business will actually slow down by itself because either you know, people will get so many near misses and then realize it's bad or they're going to have some big incidents. And then they go, shit, we cannot be doing things like this. Right? So, and, and the reality is I guarantee you that in most organizations, identity access is already slowing down the business because people understand that you cannot just do things this way. But if they don't have good solutions that scale, and I think that's where I think security, we still don't have good ways to talk about this. I'll, I'll completely make the business case that a good identity access management system allows teams to accelerate, actually increases innovation, allows teams to experiment, allows teams to do a lot of more crazy stuff, which is what they want to do in a much safer place because we have visibility. It's like, you know, the security measures in a car. Like the more, think about it, the more security measures we have in the car, the less skillful the driver needs to be, right? And that's very important because we, we kind of want the drivers to focus on things, something else, right? Or in this case, the developer should be focused on business functionality, not, you know, am I going to freaking crash the car, right? So again, you know, maybe the analogy of car designers is that the car designers today are thinking a lot more of the experience of being in the car than, you know, is the car going to freaking crash for the car in front? But why is that? Because we have, you know, um, great brakes. We have great detection. Now, a lot of the new cars have, you know, a distance detection where the car slows down by itself. Like all those security measures in a way allow the developers of the cars to focus on things outside of the security of the car. And that's what we want to give. We want to allow the business to focus on the business value that they want to provide. But we need like, or you're saying those building blocks, right? That allows you to plug this thing together in a, in a safe way that you actually go faster. But I still don't, don't think that that we have good data to prove that and good models and good visualizations to show we do, we get security right, we get identity access management right, you actually will go faster. You ship faster, you, you have faster features to your developers and your customers and you have happy customers and you have a happy service and, you know, and a happy revenue, whatever is driving the business, right? Nice. Very cool. Well, I think we are on top of the hour. So any, any final thoughts? Can we go around, James? Any final thoughts? Uh, identity by design, bake it in in your design processes. That's yeah. what I, I say that about everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Marius. I think it's the main point is keep it simple. Uh, make sure you address business risks, and um, I think the key point is being it simple. That make sure they can scale based on your business so so it doesn't yeah. fall by the wayside so it's managed all the time yeah cool Mark. Um, my point is uh, to have a continuous process that uh, will reassess the status of the current policies will monitor for drifts um, so you can always improve um, and make sure that whatever you've decided a year ago is still there yeah <laughs> good point or I'd like to build uh, on Barack's uh, point and say it's a it's ongoing and B you need to find the sweet spot in each point in time like don't try to build everything from day one figure out what it's important now understand that it's going to be an on, ongoing process and for the, the point we're in now start with the best practices and uh, off the shelf solutions that you can use so you can live to fight another day. Yeah, 
I was just to on that. Like, I think the same thing with cryptography. People these days understand don't develop your own cryptography. I think in the authentication, people say don't develop your own auth providers. Identity access management is the same thing. Because actually, in a lot of businesses, integrity and uh, confidential integrity, sorry, is as important, if not more important, than availability and sometimes even confidentiality of the data. Cool. Great panel. This is really good. Thanks for participating. And I'll, I'll see you guys in the next summit sessions. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. It was a pleasure.